From Studio C at the USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, I'm Max Schwartz. And I'm Allie Main. And you're watching Vote 2016's live election night coverage, Iowa Caucus Edition. Tonight we'll, we will be joined for our first hour of coverage with, uh, with special guest Nico Mele. Nico is a campaign veteran and technology innovator. But uh, he is in route currently, so we are going to currently we are going to recap what has happened so far. At the current time, Hillary Clinton is ahead uh, by two points over Bernie Sanders, and the current Republican lineup is Cruz versus Cruz, Trump, and then Rubio. But we have seen a higher turnout than norm, than, or a higher turnout, which was sort of expected because the weather was going, the, the clear weather was going to hold. But the results weren't matching what everyone had thought. Right, like you said, the the turnout was expected because of what we were thinking about the weather. But the results, I mean, some would say are even completely unexpected with Clinton and Cruz leading the pack at the moment. That is true, and we were certainly expecting there to be, with a higher turnout, we were expecting Sanders to g come in first, like President Obama did in 2008, and we were expecting Trump, who has a populist appeal, to come in first, but instead it's the evangelical candidate, and it is the Democratic establishment's candidate. Yeah, which is interesting, because we expected, with these weather conditions, for some of these first-time voters who would um, go to Sanders, as well as like you mentioned, these Trump supporters who also may be first-time voters in these type of caucuses. That is true. And speaking of, I guess, first-time voters, first-time candidates, Martin O'Malley, it has been reported now by CNN along with the Des Moines Register and other news outlets that he will be suspending his campaign after not even really registering on any of the polls. Right, yes. M O'Malley himself has not made a comment on this yet, but his campaign sources have been speaking to CNN as well as other outlets. So. And I, I frankly am not surprised. I thought he was going to be able to, I thought he would drop out at some point, and it's, I was expecting him to sort of drop out by the time New Hampshire came around, but I didn't expect it to be the night of the caucus, and granted, I was expecting him to get one or two percent. Yeah, and especially after the, uh, the CNN town hall last week when um, he was asked if he didn't poll as well as he um, would want to in the caucuses, who should his supporters go to? He, he did not take that question um, Seriously, and give it a all. serious answer. He, he said, no, I am the leader that America needs. So, you know, we'll see what he says after this. But I, don't, I honestly don't think that was an issue because he didn't really have many supporters at any of the precinct right, venues as we yeah. were looking at the maps. And it, it is interesting to show that uh, on the maps, we had Polk County, which is one of the largest counties in Iowa. Clinton was dominating there. And he, Bernie Sanders was in the areas where there are generally more evangelicals on the Republican side. So he was winning out on the western portion of the state, whereas Hillary was winning down the middle as the population center. And as we saw, as John King pointed out, Clinton is carrying the precincts and the counties that were won by John Edwards in 2008. So as he pointed out, they didn't even go, they didn't go to Obama or they didn't go to her. Right, and it's interesting, too, that you mentioned Clinton took Polk County as taking these bigger counties because, you know, maybe that is giving her the push that she needed in Iowa. Yeah, the population center is certainly what has done it. But I am sort of surprised that there wasn't a greater turnout for Donald Trump, but it certainly shows that the evangelical vote is strong. And as Chris Wallace pointed out at the Republican at the Republican debate last Thursday, is 60% of previous primary voters were evangelical. There were some polls that were indicating there would only be 47% turnout, but it appears that the larger the larger number is to be the case. Right, and we we knew that the evangelicals were going to turn out for Cruz likely, but um, I think Trump's voters, Trump's caucus goers, were a little more unpredictable, and we're seeing that in the results that we have currently. Yes, and I am going to quickly just check on the latest numbers to make sure we are providing as accurate information as possible. And it does have, it is now a tighter race on the Democratic side. As we see, we have Hillary oh, wow. at 50, Bernie Sanders at 49. So that, so Bernie certainly is climbing and there is time left because only 81% of precincts reporting. And as the, for the Democrats, there's a 15% threshold and it's all proportional. Mm -hmm. So that would mean that even though Ber Clinton may have the one percentage point lead, Bernie Sanders still gets nearly half of the delegates. Right, which is very interesting. And it's interesting, too, because, you know, um, Clinton was ahead in the poll released yesterday, but uh, Bernie Sanders... But not the one this morning. Not the one this morning, right. Bernie Sanders in the new Quinnipiac 
poll mm -hmm. um, was ahead today. So we'll see where and the, that goes. And the reason for that is Professor Bob Shrum, the, the former Democratic strategist, said in classes because Quinnipiac was anticipating um, more of the younger turnout, more of the first-time caucus-goer turnout than was the Des Moines Register. They weren't expecting the numbers that, that propelled President Obama to victory. And as we see on the Republican side, Ted Cruz has a three percentage point lead over Donald Trump, 27-24. Rubio is in third with 22. Mm -hmm. And what do you think about Rubio being in third for the establishment? Well, we knew that an establishment candidate was going to come in third place because it was either going to be Trump or the evangelical Cruz in first, and which one wasn't in first was going to be in second. And the polling from, yesterday, from Saturday and the polling from this morning both indicated that Rubio was the clear establishment favorite. So I'm not surprised at all that he won. What I am a little bit surprised about is how poorly Chris Christie is polling. Right, yeah. Because, you know, it was definitely going to be Trump and Cruz, first and second, no matter what. But the establishment was a little bit up to the voters. The voters are choosing Rubio at the moment. But, yeah, how are the other But as you point, just quickly on the establishment, though, as Jake P Tapper pointed out, that's 57%. Now it's more. Now, it, now it's... Now it's slightly more, now it's about, now or I guess now it's a little less, but it's still over 50% are choosing the non-establishment candidate, which right. is a slap in the face to the party. Yeah, and we'll see after this, after tonight and during tonight, how the establishment will respond to this. Are they going to, you know, put a little bit more behind these establishment candidates? Are they going to look at Cruz and Trump? And, and one thing that's important to note about these is that these are, in fact, actual percentage points and these are this is a winner take all system for the republicans it's not proportional mm -hmm. so you have to win whereas the democrats their percentages don't mean as much and we don't know necessarily the most accurate percentage but the we're just going off what's unreported which may or may not be 100 percent accurate so it is more important the percentages the more the percentages are more important for the republicans than they are the democrats yeah and going off of that the the democratic caucuses and republican caucuses are quite different in iowa Oh, absolutely. And quickly, while, because before we get into the other candidates, mm -hmm. it is important to note that Iowa may be important in the nominating process, but they are not important when it comes to overall delegate selection count because right. Democrats have 2,382 needed to win. Iowa only represents 44, and Republicans, it's 30 out of 1,237. Right, so what we're looking here isn't necessarily the delegates that are going to get these people um, the nominations, it's more just the momentum from this selection process that might might help them out in the future. Or, or hurt not. them and or make not. them hit yeah, a wall, as we're seeing with Martin O'Malley right, right now. And as we're looking, it's 27 for Cruz, 24 for Trump, 22 for Rubio, and then a big drop to Ben Carson, who's down to nine, which is a little bit, which is different than what the Des Moines Register said. They had him polling at 10 percent on Saturday. Yeah, and what do you what do you think that Ben Carson is the next candidate on that list? Well, I think it's not surprising because we had anticipated that if there were going to be enough evangelicals, he would come in fourth. Right. So it's not entirely surprising. I guess what is a little bit surprising is how low he is. We thought we, he would have possibly, possibly been able to stay in double digits. But as, one, as super PACs have allowed others to do, and allow, as campaign donations have allowed others to do, he's still fighting. So he's got enough money to be able to continue this if he so mm -hmm. chooses, which makes the divisions within the Republican Party even stronger. And like you said, Christie is very low on that list. On the last um, I saw, he was even below Mike Huckabee, who wasn't even in the, the, um, the primetime debate for Fox last week. By one one-hundredth of one Not percentage Not much, right, point. but he's, yeah, he's pretty low in the polls. And Huckabee was the 08 winner, and he's down there now. And right. Rick St. Torms even is polling at less than one percentage point at this point. Mm -hmm. And he is registering at less than one percentage point, and he was the 2012 victor. So it shows that the evangelical candidates, the parties moved on from them and have embraced Ted Cruz. But on that note, as we talked about in our preview story up on uscannenbergmedia.com, mm -hmm. we, we, you do see a problem with the establishment candidates in that three or four, depending on how many there are, are splitting the vote from one another. Right. And one was going to have to drop out of the, uh, after this. And I think it's becoming clear what that choice is going to be. It's just now, now a matter of whether the candidates yield for Rubio or not. Yeah, and this election season so far, we've seen so many Republican candidates the whole time through. Not many, I mean, there have been many that have dropped out, but all of these candidates are still holding on, so we'll see what happens. Do you anticipate that they will actually drop out? I don't know. I think a lot of them are kind of still sticking to their convictions whatever their, their missions may be, you know. Christy, I don't think so, not yet. What do you think? 
Well, Christie is an interesting one because yeah. he hasn't, he hasn't in, in, given his intentions about what he plans to do. I personally think he has too big of an image because he's the governor of New Jersey and because of the way he talks and the way he acts. I don't think that he will yield. I think that he'll stay in. If there's anyone who's going to drop out at this point, I think it will be Jeb Bush because of yeah. because of how he's polling. And let's see, he's polling there at 2.81%. So if he doesn't drop out, donors will leave, forcing him to drop out anyway. And then... Even if, and even if they reach a mutual agreement, it will be for him to drop out because they want to go to Rubio. Right, yeah, we spoke about that. These donors who are behind Jeb Bush kind of getting a little frustrated because they are like, what are we doing here? We should be kind of putting all of our support behind Rubio and getting Rubio a little farther ahead. And as, I mean, in, as Bloomberg reported last night when we had the SEC filings out, and you were able to tell from t in 2015 that his super PAC completely lost all, lost all confidence mm -hmm. in him. In the first half of 2015, Bloomberg said, or reported based off the filings, that his, can his super PAC raised over $100 million in the first six months of 2015. In the second six months, it raised only 15. Yeah, yes. And I also, um, among the other Republican candidates, I saw... Um, John Kasich is down even a little farther, but he was recently endorsed by the New York Times, and as you said, he's he doesn't plan on dropping out after this or anytime soon. And he's indicated on Showtime's The Circus that he's not leaving. And right. he, depending on which poll, he has been up in New Hampshire, and so he could use that to bounce back. Mm -hmm. However, it is unlikely at this point that that will happen, given that Rubio has the momentum of the establishment, we'll, we're, it will likely mean polls will change in New Hampshire. Right, and Kasich is so moderate, he's not, he's not establishment, he's not evangelical, so he's not really getting that kind of support that the other candidates Where it will work is, Cal is states where there's a more of a liberal Republican, like, right. like the Pacific Coast. Yeah, which, you know, may not be enough to get him that nomination. No, but California <laughs> is a significant yeah. amount of delegates, and exactly. at this point it is certainly been an interesting start to the 2016 selection process. Yes, I agree. And we, I guess with that, we will take a short pause and we will return at 7.30. And welcome back to Vote 2016 coverage of the Iowa caucus. This is our live coverage and analysis. I'm Max Schwartz. And I'm Allie Main. And we have some news to report. We have, since the last time we saw you, the Associated Press, along with other sources, have declared Ted Cruz to be the winner of the Republican caucus, followed by Donald Trump, who is in second place, Rubio in third, Carson in fourth, and Rand Paul in fifth. And that is all with 84% of precincts reporting. So, what do you think about all that? I, I am not too surprised. I did think a few more Trump supporters were going to come out, but like I said before, Trump supporters were a little more unpredictable than the an evangelicals who are going for Cruz. So, not too surprised. What do you think? That is true. I am a little bit surprised because everything was delayed to start off because turnout was higher than expected and yeah. it was there were overflow crowds at some of these precincts. Yes, I So, did see because that. of that, I was expecting Donald Trump to be able to come out in first. It will be very interesting now, I think, to see whether or not he has the ego, excuse me, to stay in after he's lost one or whether he's going to try to fight this out till the end because you know he can because of his funding. Yes. Um, I think he's going to stay in. What do you think? He doesn't like to lose, so I That's really don't true. know whether yeah. one's enough. But at the same time, if he goes out a loser, that, he wouldn't like that. So I could, I could see him doing both, probably more with the staying in. If he loses New Hampshire now, because we obviously he it's no longer a guarantee, mm -hmm. then I think then I think he seriously considers dropping out. But Trump is so unpredictable. Who knows at this? Yeah, point? who knows with Trump? But uh, fo the following Republican candidates, Rubio, you know, he's the establishment choice at least in this caucus. Yes, I think this solidifies that he is a choice among the establishment, mm -hmm. which is sort of surprising because some of the establishment. I mean, well. Excuse me, it's not surprising that the establishment's behind him. But if he's able to secure support from other factions of the party, it is sort of interesting that some of these people would select someone who is half Cuban. Right, interesting. But um, do you think that, that that really matters in terms of his policies? No, but I think there are some people, just like how there are some Republicans who don't like Obama because of his race or because of his supposed religion in their minds, I'm sure that there are some, and as Donald Trump, the fact that he's been all anti-immigrant, and I mean, it make, even though Rubio is not an immigrant, the fact that he is of Cuban descent makes you wonder whether or not he can 
Rubio will be able to secure the other factions, which ultimately is you need someone who can bridge the gap and you sort of unify all three in order to win the in order to win. Yeah. So it will be very interesting to see whether he can do that. If he's able to maintain his current pace of being at the top of the establishment pack, I certainly think that he will be on the ticket somehow. And especially the nomination if this continues, because I really don't expect Ted Cruz to win in non-evangelical states such as Nevada, such as California, the Pacific Coast. I certainly don't see him winning north of the Mason-Dixon line on Super Tuesday. I think that goes to Rubio. Right, yeah. What we're looking at right now, you know, this is, like we remember, this is Iowa. This isn't the nation yet. This is Iowa That's true. choosing their candidates. So although, yes, like you said, there's such a high evangelical turnout in this state, it doesn't mean – it's not an end-all, be-all yet. That is, that is true, and it is. it will be interesting to see if Trump can bounce back and now win New Hampshire because there aren't, that, there aren't as many evangelicals in New Hampshire. So if he's able to come in first there, that could sway the tides yet again. So there's a lot that is left to happen here, and this is some of the most interesting primary seasons I've seen in a long time. Oh, yes, absolutely, especially with Trump, like we said, very unpredictable. And also, do you think for these establishment candidates, since some of them are polling or – pulling in the caucus is very, very low, um, maybe lower than they expected. Do you think that any of these candidates are going to drop out and then maybe have their supporters go then back Rubio? Do you think that's going to happen, or are they going to stay? What do you think? Well, the I don't think Kasich and Christie are moving anytime soon. Bush's people, yes, if, if he drops out, then they will flock to Rubio. Mm -hmm. uh, but Rand Paul... Surprising or not, I, I'm sort of surprised by how far, how well he did, relatively speaking. He came in fifth with 4.52%. I don't see him leaving anytime soon, although I do. he probably will leave after New Hampshire because he's still running for his Senate seat, although he's technically allowed mm -hmm. to do both. I, don't, I can't imagine him staying through if he's only receiving... If he's receiving less than five percent of the polls, the, ev the the other evangelical candidates, I could see them all moving to Cruz. Carson, you mean? Well, Carson, although he's going to stay in it, but I mean more yeah. like Mike Huckabee and Rick Santorum. Right, and yeah, I mean Mike Huckabee wasn't pulling well, but he was pulling above Christie and a little while back, so yeah, you know we'll see if he stays in or leaves. But it, again, it shows you just as the establishment shifts to the next guy, mm -hmm. the evangelical candidates sort Are of do as well, the or the evangelical faction of the party also does. Yeah, it is. It's interesting in this um, election season to see how there's that split in the Republican Party and how that's playing out. Because there are so many candidates in those categories, but... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And moving to the Democrats now, we had 84% precincts reporting, and it was 49% for Sanders, 50% for Hillary Rodham Clinton. So it was within so one. And I imagine that there are still votes to count, and this is obviously a little close to call. So, so close, yeah. But are you surprised Bernie's not ahead? Yes, I am surprised Bernie's not ahead because, you know, the weather wasn't terrible. The polls were, or the caucuses were crowded. Bernie, you know, I don't know too much about how well this bus transportation is working out, but supposedly he had some programs in place for that to get these first-time caucus goers out. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a little surprised. What do you think? Well, I, I think the busing program obviously worked if there was increased mm -hmm. turnout. But, and I think he was able to sort of win around the universities. Yeah. I, I am also surprised, for the same reason I'm surprised that Trump's not ahead, it's because of the turnout. I would have expected the two to be on top, but they're not. Yeah, everything leading up to today, you know, uh, they were saying if if it goes this way, if the weather's this way, if these people get out to the polls, it's going to be Trump and Sanders, and it's, you know, it's not at the moment. So That is very interesting. true. It's but very I will say the Des Moines Register poll, which was right in 2008 by picking Obama, and everyone had thought that was going to be incorrect, did pick Clinton, albeit by a right. smaller margin. So that did put some doubt in my mind in his ability to do, to do this. Granted, there was a they, they weren't necessarily correct on the, we'll have to wait and see whether they were correct on the young person, first mm -hmm. time caucus goer vote. But I do, I, I am surprised. Yeah, and Clinton, you know, although Sanders has been getting so much support, Clinton, Clinton isn't exactly a weak candidate. So it's not surprising that she's in this position. Well, she she's seemed weak in recent weeks yeah. because of the fact that she's turned to asking Sanders for his medical records, attacking him for his health care right. plan, just attacking him by sort of like Jeb Bush, all but getting rid of her message 
and say, and running a campaign on I'm the one who can do this. You have to elect me because I'm the only one who can beat the Republicans. And Bush saying that he's the only he's the one with the record and you have to elect me. Yeah. 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 And after the town hall, you know, although she was her message was very strongly, I this is a hard job. I've done a little bit of this job before. Like I'm the one who can do this job, but. People didn't respond. Like people still responded pretty well to her town hall performance. That is true, but I and the pundits and talking heads on television thought that she won. Yeah. There were other people who thought Bernie won, and this the, yeah. the town hall was the first time we got a clear cut answer on from Bernie about guns, and at the same time Clinton still failed to acknowledge that her email problem was a mistake, and who knows because now we know because since then we've known that 22 emails were marked as are now marked as top secret whether that hurts her is anyone's guess at this point right and like you know like bernie has said and like many have said you know he doesn't want to get into this issue too much in the campaign because he's like this is a legal issue that's still going on i don't want to make this political i want to run my campaign let's talk about the issues so Mm -hmm. although that was an issue in the uh in the town hall that hillary may or may not have answered to I don't know if how much it's really affecting people's decisions. It's not at this point. Mm-hmm. Where it will affect is if sometime down the line the FBI comes out and said that she broke the right. laws. Absolutely, yes. So at and which we don't know whether they're gonna do. Yeah. So it will be very interesting to see. Now in terms of what's trending on Twitter, now earlier this afternoon we had seen that Bernie was talking about more on Twitter than Hillary was. Mm-hmm. Granted that was at around five o'clock. But and we don't know whether those are positive or negative. But then, since then, trending topics have sort of changed as these have right. developed, obviously. And we're not—we don't have the metric software that we did earlier, but we will—we will have that. We will have the latest metric information for you either tomorrow or the following day. We have Iowa caucuses trending, Martin O'Malley trending, MSNBC, and Brian Williams. Right, and MSNBC is probably because those were—that was one of the organizations who was announcing Cruz as the winner. Mm-hmm. They were reporting Cruz as the winner. Martin O'Malley probably suspending his campaign, according to sources. Um, also, one of the trends I saw, you mentioned, you know, Bernie was being mentioned more than Hillary's being mentioned more. One of the trends was actually Bernie and Hillary, so probably because they're so close in the polls. And make an, and and people are talking about them together. And mm-hmm. what was really interesting is when we were digging deep in the weeds of the Twitter results earlier this afternoon, a lot of the tweets were coming from journalists, not necessarily the people at the caucus precincts. And so journalists were mentioning both. Right. And, you know, it is surprising that these were coming from journalists and not so much as the people at the caucuses because the caucuses are such a social event. And in this particular year, in this particular um, caucus season, social media is so much bigger to these people than what it was four years ago, what it was eight years oh, ago. Oh, that's that's very true. And we'll get to social media right, in a moment. We'll but talk about that. Pardon me for looking at my phone, but I am getting breaking news alerts that from various sources, we are from CNN, KNX, CBS News, um, excuse me, not CBS News, but CNN and KNX 1070, Mike Huckabee, Huckabee is suspending his presidential campaign. Again, not really surprising. Yeah, not surprising. His supporters will probably shift to Ted Cruz. Mm-hmm. And as CBS is reporting that Marco Rubio is happy about a third place finish, which you and I were expecting because yeah. he, that's the best that he could have gotten. Yeah, it's not surprising that he's happy about that because that means he is the top establishment candidate at this point. Absolutely. From this results, these and results. There was another alert that came through, um, and I, that, is, that is from Nico. He is running a little bit late, but he's on his way. We so, will talk to him soon. And we will talk to him soon about social media. So I do want to hold our conversation yes. about social media until then. But I do want to give some background on the caucuses, and that is that each – there are, the precincts in here and the amount of delegates are divided up by population, and these are from the census. So we have 1,681 total precincts in Iowa. And, of course, Democrats have a 15 percent threshold. Republicans have a winner-take-all system. Mm-hmm. So even here, if – the numbers stay the same, and Hillary wins by one percentage point. It's Sanders still fared pretty well. Yeah, but he's it would still going to get so many, or you know, pretty many delegates he, out of this. Get sh- sh- shot a little bit shy of the twenty uh-huh. of the half of twenty-two. But it would be a moral blow to him, and it would be an emotional yeah. blow because he really needed a win here to prove that he wasn't just a northeastern candidate. Right, but I don't know. Do you think he's still proving himself with the forty-nine percent? If that's what the it closes that. I think it is, but there's something about the morale and the emotion yeah. of, of having that fifth about winning 
And even though yeah. you did well, or even if you tied, which he could very well still tie, I think the fact that you, I think it's still an emotional blow considering how close it was and how hard he worked. But what's right. not an emotional blow is that he raised $20 million in January. Right, yeah. That, that in itself proves he's viable, but in a different way. Yeah, and he's, you know, this is big to his message about campaign finance reform. He's talking so much about how he he's built this online individual campaign finance base. So, you know, this is proving that it's working for him in some ways, at least. And Nico will talk about this more, but he was getting small dollar donations, so people were able to go back to him, whereas right. Clinton was getting top dollar from all, from a, just a few people, and she could not go back to them. And we're going to talk to Nico about all this later, but the $20 million proves that he can certainly go on a long, long fight. Yeah, exactly. And it, this is what's making this election season so interesting, I think, all these... these uh, kind of new strategies being used and look you can finance a campaign like this with this online base oh absolutely and speaking of new strategies this was the first time that the that the, that the parties had an app so they were reporting mm -hmm. in real time and getting viability numbers so we were getting real-time results and we don't have to deal with any of the madness from 2012 right and even for the iowa caucus there was a des moines register app so yeah. we were getting getting results from there and on social media and i well, we will wait for nico but just a quick point that this is the first time social media has been full effect for both parties in 2012 it didn't necessarily matter and the republicans weren't necessarily at the technological point they are now and mm -hmm. then in 2008 it was still too new yeah and it's a i don't know it's surprise it's strange to me to think in that way because it feels like social media has it's grown so exponentially in the time since then that it's hard to imagine that in the past two elections that it wasn't what it is now. Yeah, I completely agree. It is sort of strange that it's uh -huh. been Especially eight with journalists, years since 2008. Yeah. Like we mentioned, with journalists tweeting so much, you know, to think that that wasn't a normal or highly used thing is strange. And we were, we were done at, or we were young, excuse me, in mm -hmm. 2008, and so we've sort of grown with the social media evolution. Mm -hmm. So to us, it's been here all the time. It's sort of, it's, a, it was, it's sort of, you have to think about it in a different perspective when thinking about the parties didn't have it. Mm -hmm. But what was really interesting is, as Wired had pointed out, that you had the possibility here of people tweeting from the caucus venues to try to lure people across the state and in their same precinct to their candidate, at least on the Democratic side, because yeah. that's how it works. And it didn't seem like that was happening very much. Yeah. It's like, like we said, especially with these younger caucus goers who are going out Presumptively for Bernie, but, you know, maybe not as much as... There were still some young people for thought. Hillary. Of course. Yes, and what was course. really interesting is that earlier, even though people would expect the young folks to be on Twitter, mm -hmm. both when you filtered by Bernie and you, you filtered by Hillary, 95% of each of the tweets mentioning their name came from, or related terms, came from people 65 and plus for mm -hmm. both of them. So think about that yeah, perspective. Yeah, very interesting. So with that, I think we're going to suspend our conversation on social media and wait for Nico to get here. Mm -hmm. We will be back at about 8.15. Welcome back to Vote 2016 coverage of the Iowa caucus. I'm Max Schwartz. And I'm Allie Main. And we have our special guest with us now, Nico Mealy. Hi, how are you guys doing? Good. Good, good evening. It's an exciting evening. <laughs> yes, it is. So Nick, uh, Allie, do you want to explain a little bit about Nico's background? Yes, so Nico um, was involved in the development of this online campaign financing, which we have seen a lot of, especially with Bernie Sanders. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And he's the Wallace Annenberg Chair of Journalism at USC, and he also has done a lot with tech companies and journalism. Yes. Delighted to be here. And it's an honor to have him with us. Of Veteran course. of both Iowa and campaigns, so it is it's certainly a perfect fit. And we have a lot to talk about. Yes, we do. <laughs> After tonight, especially. So, first question is, are you at all surprised by our results? And for, to update our viewers, we have CNN saying Hillary has fit about 50%, while Bernie has about 49%, and Cruz has been declared the winner of the Republicans. He's uh, been Donald Trump, who's only one or two above Marco Rubio. That's right. So we have Cruz in first place, uh, Trump in second, Cruz in third. It's roughly what is expected, what the pundits have been talking about for the last two or three weeks. Also roughly in line with what we expected from the polling. I think uh, on the Democratic side, very close race between Hillary and uh, Bernie. 
much closer than anybody expected. Uh, but in both cases, Republican and the Democratic side, much greater turnout than anyone anticipated. And I think on the Democratic side, a greater turnout should have been a much more decisive victory for Bernie. The fact that it's so close that Hillary is winning so many of the college and university towns is really bad news for Bernie and I think to some extent shows Hillary's unexpected strength in Iowa. On the Republican side, I think despite the overwhelming new uh, caucus goer turnout and the incredible turnout there on the Republican side, uh, Trump is still really uh, in second place, which is roughly where we expected him to, to be. I mean, I think the, the real surprise tonight is that the polls were more or less right. We're kind of where everyone expected we were going to be. And uh, big winners, Rubio, much closer third place finish than I think anyone anticipated. Mm -hmm. And um, and probably, you know, the loser tonight is Fox News. You know, Trump skipped that debate on Thursday, and it does not appear to have hurt him at all. Do you think he would have been in first had he actually attended? I think if he'd spent another $10 million in Iowa, he might be first. And I do want to, I do want to kick this off now by starting off about the high turnout. And you say it would have expected, the, the difference is, I think we, higher turnout was supposed to mean Trump, and higher turnout was supposed to mean Bernie. But that didn't happen, and Bernie surprisingly won the rural parts of Iowa along the western, along the western part of the state, while Bernie was able to win the. Oh, I'm sorry, while Hillary well, was able to win the population centers. I think it's a little too close across the board to see exactly like the numbers are are too tight to definitively say anything. The only numbers I've seen that I thought were really compelling is that uh, Bernie clearly run. Had a, I shouldn't say clearly one. Bernie had a slight edge among people with college educations. Hillary had a slight edge with those who didn't finish college. And that's about the only thing I think we can definitively say at this point from the Democratic turnout. And where do you think some of that support for Hillary was coming from, though? Well, I think, you know, Hillary is, uh, she's well-known quantity in Iowa, right? I mean, she's mm -hmm. campaigned there multiple times. Uh, I think uh, in some ways I'm, I'm, you know, surprised that um, that she didn't do a little bit better tonight, actually. But in other ways, I think we've seen Bernie trending towards a. Uh, every, I think everyone expected a bigger victory given the turnout for Bernie. Mm -hmm. So kind of two sides to that coin. Overall, I think it's a big win for Hillary that she managed to uh, either we don't know yet she's either going to win or she's going to come in a very close second, despite a turnout that 24 hours ago would have meant uh, most people would have assumed meant a giant Bernie victory. And Max and I were actually just talking about this. What do you think, if Bernie doesn't win, you know, if he doesn't win tonight, what do you think that's going to do for him psychologically, emotionally? Well, Bernie's a, a, a well-known figure in New Hampshire as opposed to Iowa where, you know, even, even eight months ago he was virtually unknown. You know, he's campaigned in Vermont for many, many years, many of the same media districts as, as New Hampshire. I mean, Bernie's really well, I'd say really well-known in Vermont, New Hampshire, uh, has in all likelihood a significant edge going into New Hampshire. Uh, but let's not forget it was, you know, New Hampshire has, has, has for the Clintons, historically been very Clinton-friendly, both for Bill and Hillary. In Hillary, in the part of Hillary, though, that was because of her crying. Otherwise, it probably would have leaned Obama. But I, do you think I, I don't know that, that that single incident carried enough weight. I mean, it certainly helped okay. her, but, you know, I think she did, she did well in New Hampshire on, on her own. And do you think that this is a bigger blow for Bernie that he didn't win or that or I think a bigger is, blow for Hillary that she didn't win by it's more? A, it's a bigger blow for Bernie that given this turnout, Bernie should have had a much more decisive victory. Yeah. And you have experience, as I said earlier, you in Iowa and you were with the Howard Dean campaign who bust in supporters, didn't necessarily go as planned. Do you think that Bernie bussing in supporters was, I guess, helped him get this far? Well, it's hard to say. I think that... Generally speaking, Bernie has run among the sharper campaigns I've seen, really been really, really, really smart and considered about how to play Iowa, much more analogous to Obama 08 than to Howard Dean 04. And one question that I do have is, do you take credit for can candidates or, I mean, would you say that it's, an, it's only because of our online donation platform that we have candidates like Obama and Bernie Sanders? I wouldn't say I take credit for them. I do think that the internet has kind of broken some of the rules that really were that that allowed some of the party establishment to be gatekeepers. 
that in the past to raise enough money to be financially viable, you really had to have access to major donors, to direct mail lists, and to the party establishment. And the Internet's changed that. The Internet's made candidates like Ben Carson, who I think is, you know, almost 10 percent tonight, kind of impressive, uh, and candidates like Bernie Sanders really do very well. And carrying on with speaking about the Internet, what role do you think social media has played in this election so far? Well, there's absolutely no doubt that uh, Trump would not be a viable candidate without Twitter. He announced his candidacy on Twitter. He's managed to dominate and drive the media cycle using Twitter. Uh, you know, I think one of the most interesting things, he's the only candidate in the race either side who really tweets himself, you can tell. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Trump has really been masterful about using Twitter to shape and direct the mainstream media and the campaigns, the campaign narrative as a whole. Uh, on the Democratic side, I mean, when we look at 2012, what big technological trends are different now as opposed to four years ago? Well, in 2012, uh, the m more Americans had flip phones than smartphones. That's kind of flipped today. So we have kind of a dramatic increase in the use of smartphones. Um, we have a really different landscape in terms of, uh, you know, Snapchat didn't exist. Uh, Bernie Sanders' campaign has run the last nine days a really aggressive voter turnout effort on Snapchat. It remains to be seen if that, what role that played or didn't play in this case. Uh, but I think that the big takeaway is, in some ways, the rise of the smartphone. And, uh, and also, I think, the, the, the weakness of television here. We're talking about somewhere north, uh, in the case of the Bush campaign, $60 million-plus spent on TV. Overall, probably $150 million or more spent in Iowa on television without a huge discernible impact. Yeah, so super, super PACs certainly didn't have the effect that they did in 2012 obviously, because otherwise Bush would have conceivably been on top. But in terms of the way Twitter was tonight, everyone was expecting Twitter to have a role in the caucus in getting people to go with one candidate or another and seeing how the trends were up and down the state, but it doesn't appear that that necessarily Look, happened. At the end of the day, caucusing and voting is profoundly non-digital. That's part of its appeal. That's kind of the nature of democracy. It's what makes, it's what makes it fantastic and wonderful to be a part of. And so uh, I think... Twitter is great for pontificating. Facebook is great for seeing who's voting and what your friends are talking about. But what matters at the end of the day is your community and you're physically showing up. Voting remains a profoundly non-digital way of interacting with our democracy. And do you think more people went out to the Iowa caucuses today and kind of understood the process more than in years past? That's a good question. I mean, I think there's some evidence that social media has a positive impact overall, broadly, on electoral participation. I mean, we have uh, Jim Fowler out of uh, UC San Diego in 2010 did a very large study, arguably, I believe, actually, the largest social science study ever conducted in the world in history. 68 million people on Facebook in the United States participated, most of them unknowingly, in four control groups to figure out if Facebook messaging could actually really increase voter turnout in a substantial way. You know, the results published in leading scientific journal Nature and pretty, I think, pretty definitively said, yes, the right Facebook message will increase voter turnout and voter participation. You know, giving some credence to the idea that social media has an impact on turnout and participation. And in terms of what now lies ahead, in terms of one, Ted Cruz, and two, Bernie Sanders, is there a path to the White House now for either of them? I'll take the Democratic side first because I think it's a little simpler. I mean, I think that uh, Bernie has enough money. Just announced, you know, yesterday he raised twenty million dollars in the in January. Really, a stunning number. Uh, a lot of cash on hand that makes him financially really viable. Most of those people are small dollar donors less than 300 donors maxed out. That means he can go back to almost everyone who's given him money and ask for another 50 bucks. And in some total, that means that Bernie could be have the money and the budget to be competitive for some time into March or April or beyond. Um, and so he'll certainly have the money if he keeps up his incredible fundraising operation and be competitive. I think the question is that when we look at the demographics and the likelihood of voter turnout, uh, can Bernie continue to be competitive once we leave New Hampshire and Iowa? And that is a big question. I mean, I think we've only had two Democratic primaries since 1980 without an African-American candidate. This is uh, the third, and 
you know, his ability to, to manage minority turnout, to really perform well among African Americans and Hispanics, that has not been tested. Iowa and New Hampshire will not be a test of that. And so I think uh, looking forward, does Bernie have a path to nomination? It's going to be tough. Plus, uh, if he happens to prevail tonight, I think we're going to see a significant increase in the attacks on him. I mean, you know, broadly speaking, I don't think he's been taken seriously by the Republican side. Um, and uh, if he starts to look like a real, a real potential candidate, you can expect the rhetoric to step up pretty substantially and to see some pretty ugly attack ads around the word socialist. On the Republican side, I mean, this is what makes this what I love about politics. It's really exciting. Could get, kind of go almost any direction. I mean, I think, you know, if we play out the scenarios for New Hampshire, one scenario is Trump wins. Now we have a three-way race, Trump, Cruz, Rubio. Uh, it's also conceivable that, uh, that we have a more establishment candidate. Kasich has been doing really well in New Hampshire. If you have Kasich 1 and Trump 2 in New Hampshire, or, K or Trump 1 and Kasich 2, now you have a five-way race. You have Trump, Kasich, Cruz, Rubio, maybe another candidate. I mean, I still think Carson's turnout tonight, just about 10%, is really impressive and unexpected. And so the Republican primary is really up for grabs in a substantial way. There'll be some winnowing. You know, if, if there's any mercy in the world, Jeb Bush will drop out. Uh, Huckabee, as I understand, has already said he's shutting mm -hmm. down his campaign. We, we wait to hear about Carly Fiorina, also Rand Paul. Big question was Chris Christie do? He's really been had a good trend line the last two weeks. It's a crowded field. I don't know how much tonight's turnout really changes much of it. A lot of them have a lot of cash on hand. Many of them have super packs with cash on hand. Uh, you know, it's it's a uh, it's it's going to be it's going to be a really uh, impressive crowd, uh, and I, I'm I'm super excited as a in a in a purely horse race kind of way to see how it plays out. You know, as you may know, the the, the rules in the Republican Party have all been kind of. Uh, reformulated for this cycle, I think originally intended to give a candidate like Jeb Bush a clear shot to the nomination, mm -hmm. but it really disproportionately rewards a Super Tuesday winner. Super and, first past the post. Yeah, so we'll we'll see how this all goes down. You know, as they say in the pool hall, there's a lot of green between here and there, and right. you know, uh, two weeks is an eternity in politics, an eternity. And one thing though about you talk about John Kasich. But now that Rubio did better than I think most people expected, does the establishment rally behind him, or do you think that they that Kasich and Christie still have a legitimate shot? You know, I think I think they still have a legitimate shot till we get through New Hampshire. You know, it's going to depend a lot on Rubio's ability to play the next few days, the next week or so. I mean, Rubio, I thought he did a very smart job taking the very first speech slot tonight. That was a pro move. Um, uh, I thought Cruz is inexplicably kind of coming on to the TV scene a little bit late tonight. I don't know what that's about. Uh, but broadly speaking, I think, you know, this is going to be an all-out street fight for the next seven days. And hopefully next Wednesday, a week from Wednesday, we'll have a little bit more clarity about what's going on here. And what do you think about um, the way this election cycle is going with these non-establishment candidates going up against more traditional candidates? The American electorate is, by and large, really unhappy with the state of the country. If you were born after 1980, which most USC students were, I hope, uh, by almost every measure, your life will be worse off than your parents. You'll uh, have more debt. You will earn less money. You'll have uh, worse health care that's more expensive. Uh, you know, your education will cost more and have a lower income and have lower impact on your income. I mean, it's really hard to find a measure by which uh, the at lives of average Americans are actually improving since 1980. And I think that's really fueling a lot of anger in the electorate. People understand that. People understand school's more expensive. Jobs are fewer, few and far between and don't pay as well. That the, that the whole structure of the economy around debt and minimum wage workers is really not, not good for most Americans. And so on both sides, both Bernie Sanders and with uh, candidates like Trump and Carson, you're seeing real, real intense anger among the electorate. It's legitimate. It is real. It is to be ignored at, you know, the party's own peril. 
but I don't see either party really offering a legitimate and compelling solution uh, to affect the kind of root underlying causes of this anger. And one final question for you is, obviously Trump, is, or excuse me, Cruz is the evangelical candidate, the reason why he won Iowa. Is there a, does his religion hurt him north of the Mason-Dixon line? You know, I think in a Republican dominating contest, I'm not sure the religion plays a huge, is going to play a huge role here for Cruz. It, it probably mostly helps him in the north. I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure the evangelicals are going to decide they're not going to really decide New Hampshire. They're not going to hurt Cruz, that's for sure. Are they going to play a substantial role in helping him? Probably not either. Um, but you look at tonight, I mean, I think uh, if evangelicals, uh, Cruz should have had a much more decisive victory tonight if, if religion mattered that much. Allie, any closing questions? I think that covered most of it. It's been a delight. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Don't forget to register to vote. Yes. And yes. June 7th is the California primary, and we will be back for one more segment in about five minutes at 8.40, or between 8.40 and 8.45. Thank you, Nico. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm Max Schwartz. And I'm Allie May. And you're back to our final segment on tonight's Vote 2016 Iowa caucus coverage. So we are here now with our reporter, Aidan McMillan, who is at the watch party put on by the Unruh Institute of Politics. So, Aidan, what went on? So, while we were there... Um, there, we had a lot of kids um, from different, sorry, political groups on campus. So we had USC students for Bernie, um, a lot of Hillary supporters. And then in terms of the actual coverage that went on um, of the Iowa caucus, we saw obviously the really, really close debate or um, numbers between um, Sanders and Clinton. And we also saw a really big win on the Republican side for Cruz. And what were people saying there as the race went on? So while the race was going on, um, the most support was definitely for Bernie, um, which I think speaks a lot to how millennials support him. Um, they were a lot more vocal. Um, and the Hillary supporters who were there were um, um, kind of, I think there was a little bit of surprise with how close the results were. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Did you get a chance to speak to any of the people and ask their opinion? Yeah, so um, as far as the Bernie supporters went, there weren't, there were very few um, Republicans in the room. I think there was one Rubio supporter who was very, very excited about how well he did. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, I think he really came through tonight, which was exciting for them. But um, as far as the Democrats go, the Bernie supporters um, were so, so excited and were saying that it's really a testament to how much he's able to um, really connect with people because when he first, he was not relevant when this whole process started. He was at something like 3%. And so to them, the way he's grown was really exciting. Um, and for Clinton supporters, um, they were saying when asked, you know, how could she do better? Um, is her, is that opinion that she's not very good at connecting with voters a problem? Um, they were looking a lot at um, how she would be, how among male candidates, like you don't talk about that. So they were, yeah, really looking at what it's like to be a, a woman in this race. And were there any Cruz or Trump supporters there? Not, not that I'm aware of. They might've been closeted supporters, but not vocal. <laughs> and were the, were the Clinton people at all sort of upset with how close it actually was? I think, well, you know what's interesting is that a lot of people are looking at this as really good for Clinton, um, how in terms of how close the race was, just because um, it, it shows that she, just because she has the Clinton name and has all these resources, she still needs um, like the, the little people below her still matter. So those little votes, um, things like that still matter. So people are going to get out there and vote for her. Um, so I don't think there's as much upset as I, I would, ex would have expected there mm -hmm. to be. Yeah. And as we were talking about with Nico earlier, it was quite a bit of a surprise that Bernie didn't do better given the strong turnout and the fact that he bust people in. Right. And especially like Aiden just mentioned with, you know, there was a lot of support you said here among college students for Bernie and, you know, these first time 
supporters probably did get to some of the caucuses at least with the yeah. busing and with you know the social media talking about but he didn't media. he didn't really as far as we know for now he didn't win right. the areas we thought he would yeah yeah it was unexpected stuff happening today well thank you very much for coming in aiden and we will see you again on our super tuesday coverage on march 1st and to recap everybody we had cruz trump and rubio respectively on the republican side and i'm looking right now it is 49.8 to 49.5 on the democratic side for clinton so we will keep you updated on tuesday you can tune into usc annenberg media for web content along with Annenberg Radio News at noon, and ATVN will have stories through online throughout the day. So from Studio C and USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, thank you very much for watching our first live election night coverage. We will be back with you on Super Tuesday. I'm Max Schwartz. And I'm Allie Main. Thanks so, for tuning in. So long.